You already knew. You already knew when we started this show that we're going to be much ado about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Every day is resurrection day after the empty tomb, after the resurrection and ascension of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We just come back to this week every year in our calendar year. Every year we get back to the essentials. We get back to welcoming the people to church who haven't been to church since Christmas. We get back to welcoming the people who, well, you know, they can do all manner of things. Some churches have 16 different services that are going on this week. And uh, that's that's very good. Invite your friends, invite your neighbors. In fact, we're going to be talking about that. Lee Strobel's got a little bit that, that's going to be coming in a little, little bit later on today. But how are you guys doing? It's the Erskine Music Show, and we're starting out the week on fire. But even more than that, we're starting out the week with boldness, which kind of is the hallmark of this show. It is all about being bold. It is all about sharing Christ. It is all about being on point and seeking first the kingdom of God. It's all about all those different things. But we're going to be bold today because we're going to do a two for Tuesday. And if you've watched this show for any length of time, you recognize that the two for Tuesday often turns into the one, maybe one and a half for Tuesday. But doggone it, I'm determined today. I got my music. I got Michael Jordan in the background. What else do we need for this show? We got the empty tune scene. We got Resurrection Sunday on the way. I'm going to be traveling and doing a revival in Springfield. And so the rest of the shows from this week are going to be from Springfield, Illinois. And so we got a whole great week plan, but it starts with a two for Tuesday. And I'm bold enough to say that I'm actually going to get not just one, but two stories going today. So without further ado, so that I can actually get to the two for Tuesday, it is the Erskine Music Show. I'm so glad you guys have tuned in today. Let's get this thing going. Oh. <laughs> Well, I want to let you guys know the comment section is turned on and that you guys are welcome to drop comments in the comment section all day today. Big Head is here reminding me that uh, today is the day that the Lord has made. <laughs> We're going to rejoice and be glad in that. Thanks, Big Head. I appreciate that in your commentary often. Potty Big Head is here because we don't stop the party, especially when we're talking about Calvinism today, right? So we're going to jump into that today and that's going to be awesome. Thank you for that. And you guys are here. And so let me get to these tags real quick because I am trying to get to two for Tuesday today. And uh, without further ado, let's be talking about what it is that we can do. We got we got special rights. We got special privileges that we can do on this show, Big Head. Because of the Copyright Act of 1976, Section 107, we're able to take other people's material and we're able to comment on that. We're able to report on that. We're able to teach from that. We're able to do some measure of scholarship and research related to what other people have done, and we're excited about that. For the folks who are watching on various audiences today, let's start from the back and go to the forward. Rumble, LinkedIn, Twitter, Twitch, Facebook, YouTube. All of you guys are making the show happen, and so I'm thankful that each of you guys is watching the show. I don't know when I watch this show sometimes if I should be saying good morning, good afternoon, Good evening, because I know that there are people who watch this respective to the various time zones they're in, and I do appreciate that. That doesn't make a dramatic difference. When you guys tune in and you're like, hey, I'm watching from uh, Zimbabwe, I'm watching from Tanzania, I'm watching from other places in the world. I do appreciate the audiences that are watching this all across the globe at any given time. Some, some of you guys watch this show live, which is great. Jump in the comment section and you can be in real time. I may actually put your comment on the screen because it is relevant to something that we're talking about at the time. But there's a lot of you guys, and I would say probably this is the bulk of when I'm talking to people about the classy audience that we have. There's a lot of you guys who write me after the show is over and you tell me how much the show meant to you or something that I was talking about or that I completely missed something or that my attitude was bad, anything, or that my language was bad. Anything that you guys want to share with me, you guys normally share with me. And I appreciate that. I appreciate the feedback. I appreciate the love. I appreciate the camaraderie. And I appreciate, and all I ask in return is two hours a day. Watch the show the first time and then go back and watch it again like I do. 
and figure out what I was actually trying to say the first time when I did it. All right, so that's that. Uh, if you've not already liked and subscribed the show, a very unique thing that you have an opportunity to do, you can vote with your mouse, the clicker of your mouse. This is what I use. You can vote with the mouse and say, we like this, we subscribe to it. We like it and we subscribe to this. And it's a really cool thing because we are just, look, I always joke about the Jehovah's Witness and the 144,000. And the fact that as soon as I get to 144,000, my elect is suddenly going to change. <laughs> I'm going to be talking about the doctrine of election today. Uh, but the elect is suddenly going to change. I'll be like the Jehovah's Witness, 144,000. That's all we got. Well, 144,001. We'll take 150,000 if we can get that, those many subscribers. But anyway, I'm going to change my doctrine just like the Jehovah's Witness, that false cult uh, that is out there. Um, so anyway, you still have room to like and subscribe until you get to the, the Frozen Chosen. Although, I think I'm going to do something very special. Since we've been, uh, I think I'm going to give a special CD or some kind of special thing to a Jehovah's Witness friend when I get to 144,000. Uh, and if they know anything about their history, they won't accept it. Uh, they'll they'll try to give me a watchtower in return. Uh, but nonetheless, <laughs> once we get to 144,000, <laughs> I want to actually, uh, you know, make provision. Uh, for somebody, maybe I can give you guys something special. You guys know I'm working on a book. Maybe I can give somebody a free book or some free merch or a t-shirt or or something when we get to 144,000. We got to make it big when we get to 144,000 because I make that joke all the time. Um, and I had somebody last week that was like, you should not have laughed at that. <laughs> well, if you've watched this show any length of time, you guys know that not only do I laugh at things like that, um, but look, I don't I don't take you very seriously. I don't take me very seriously sometimes. Um, the only thing that I take seriously is my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the fact that there's people who are going to a real place called hell. They are going to a real place called heaven. And there's a broad road of many people who are going to hell. I take those kind of things very seriously. But we kind of get there sometimes through levity. And I appreciate that. So like and subscribe if you have not already. All right, we are on track today. Two stories. If I keep talking, we won't get two stories. So let's get two stories. Let's pray. Grab your Bibles. I'm going to be the, the text of the scripture is not necessarily um, Matthew chapter 16, but my text is going to be Matthew chapter 16. Uh, so let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness, and your grace. Um, and it's uh, we are walking down the Via Della Rosa uh, toward the cross, Resurrection Sunday will be highlighted for many people to hear the essence of what Christianity is. And let there be no confusion. I know that there's mm, Elevation Church and other people out there who don't want to talk about the blood of Jesus and they don't want to talk about all these different things, but let, let them not be so classy and so contemporary that they forget about the essence of what Christianity is. There's an atonement that was made on the cross of Jesus Christ. The required his blood. The writer of Hebrews would tell us without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. And so help us to focus on Christ, the true Christ, the Christ of the Bible, uh, and not get ourselves wrapped around trying to be so cool that people everywhere and at all times will just fall over themselves understanding. I think people understand. This devotion will be very simple. I think people understand, they understood in Jesus' day and they're still understanding that they cannot have their lives, their sin, their way of doing thing, and also have Christ. I think that's the rub. And so help us today as we go into our devotional time uh, to make much of Christ so that you will draw men to yourself. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Grab your Bibles. We're in Matthew chapter 16. That's going to be my text. And then we're going to get to our devotion today. All right, I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 16. This is the uh, Caesarea Philippi Confession. Peter is going to hear declare that Jesus is the Messiah. And this is a bold claim for Peter and a bold claim even for today. I'll begin reading at verse 13. Grab your Bibles. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? 
They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by the Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he orders disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. And this is from our daily bread. And this is the daily devotion. They've gone around the world and they've asked the question. Let's ask the question today. Who is Jesus and what impact upon your life is that? Let's do it. It's a very pointed and personal question, isn't it? If you've been following our daily bread this past week, you know that this is the foundational question for the In Pursuit of Jesus series we've just completed. It's the question the host of the series, Rasul Berry, asked every person in each part of the world he visited. In a way, it's the question he's asking us too. Do we really believe that Jesus' way is the way of life? That Jesus is life? Jesus initially asked a woman named Martha this question. She was overcome with grief at the death of her beloved brother Lazarus. Part of her culture believed that there might be a resurrection of life at the end of all time, okay. and yet another did not. Jesus challenged her cultural expectation with a declaration, mm -hmm. I am the resurrection, I am the life. No need to wait, Martha, I've arrived. In Sweden... Now before we get to Sweden, let's deal with the thing that Jesus said and is most pressing for us today and in this moment comment section is turned on here because I want that smoke but let's deal with the question and the statement that Jesus is making with reference to him being the resurrection this is uh, with all due respect a nonsensical statement Lazarus who has been dead for four days Lazarus, who has succumbed to the, the natural course of death, is now in view, and, and we're recognizing that if something doesn't take place, some, some difference that takes place other than what we commonly know, Lazarus is dead, the rest of us are dead, death comes for us, and when death apprehends us and holds us in its clutches, there we are. Unless you're into some strange Bethel stuff, today you don't typically go to funerals where there are dead people and spend a lot of time and machinations and, and things trying to raise and inculcate that person from the grave or from the tomb we typically recognize that from genesis chapter 3 and on death has been a perpetual plodding course that affects all of humanity and whether you are rich or poor whether you're black or white, as Michael Jackson would say, it don't matter if you're black or white. Whatever your situation in life is, death will impact you. And for those who are watching today, I, I'm quite sure that I don't have to belabor the point because I'm trying to get to two stories today. I don't have to belabor the point because you know that death comes to your family members. Death comes to your friends in an untimely manner. Death is... And the effects of the fall are creeping upon your own body, perhaps even now. And so when Jesus makes the statement about him being the resurrection, this is not a common statement to be made. Oh, to be sure, there were insurrectionists in Jesus' day. There were people who claimed to have a certain power, people who claimed to have a certain authority, people who were doing what quote unquote could be categorized as miracles that because they were out of the ordinary and claiming that they could do these things so that people would follow them. You, you project that into the book of Acts and you begin to see that there were such people who were alive even during De Jesus' day. But Jesus is making a claim that is extraordinary. Jesus calls himself the resurrection. And if you're a cynic, you laugh him off the stage and you say, 
Jesus, get on out of here. What, are you, what in the world are you talking about? It's kind of like C.S. Lewis is talking about. He's lunatic, liar, or Lord. Lunatic in the sense that if he is the resurrection, that means that the grave will not hold him and that he will lead to a life in which the grave will not hold other people if they believe and trust in him. That's a lunatic statement. Or is he actually speaking truthfully with regards to who he is, how he should be believed, and what our proper response to him is? And I would submit to you this morning that indeed he is speaking truth and that truth is palatable to those who have a humble heart to recognize I'm not going to overcome the grave. I'm not going to overcome death. I'm not going to push my money or my influence onto Jesus and say, Jesus, I've kept all the commandments. I've done all the different things I'm supposed to do. I'm good, right? <laughs> See how Jesus dealt with rich young ruler and all those that would submit some answer to how the longevity and their eternality is going to go. We've submitted a bunch of answers before God. All of them are insufficient. The only sufficient answer is the atonement of Jesus Christ. If he's not raised from the grave, friends, we're not raised from the grave either. And Paul is succinct enough, but clear enough to tell us in 1 Corinthians that if he be not raised, then none of us are raised. And if he didn't overcome sin and death, then we don't overcome sin and death either. We're just doing religious things. This is just a religious broadcast to take up people's time, space, energy, effort, and mental space. It's entertainment at best if Jesus be not raised from the grave. But since he is raised from the grave, some where's the gospel choir when you need him? <laughs> but since he is who he says he is. Hallelujah. 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 Then we have hope. And so let's let them cook with daily bread. Let's let them do what they do. Let's talk about Sweden. Consider the most secular nation in the world. We watch Russell meet an academic named Pear, who thoughtfully said, yes, Jesus and not secularism is the life in Singapore. The most religious nation in the world, we watched Rasul talk with Waitse, who said, yes, in the midst of diverse spiritual claims, Jesus is the life. In Argentina, we watched Rasul mm. interact with Alejandro, who was so impacted by the new life Jesus offered that Alejandro now spends his life offering help to others who try to find the answers in drugs and hard living. And in South Africa, Winna shared with Rasul how faith in Jesus' resurrection is transforming a nation ravaged by apartheid into a new nation, a rainbow nation of hope. All right. So we done gone around the world. And here's what I would submit today. Daily Bread has gone around the world. This interviewer has gone around the world. I don't know what series they're talking about here, but I can suspect that it's some series in which they're on site, they're on location, and they're talking to people. And the first thing you do is when you get to a secular nation, you recognize there's not a lot of people around here. What percentage are we talking about of people around here who are actually followers of Jesus Christ? What are we talking about here? Are we talking about 10%? Are we talking about 5%? And a lot of the countries, I'm looking at the map right now, and a lot of countries in the world where there's hostility toward the gospel, we're talking about less than 2% of those those who are Christians. Let's imagine for, for some instance that you're in an area that is not heavily populated with Christians, i.e. East Nashville. What do you do? Do you fold up the tent? Do you roll into your cave and say, you know what, I'm just going to build a structure here? Or for my favorite that are out there, the preppers. Hey, preppers, how you doing? Preppers and young earthers. <laughs> I love you guys. I just think you're idiots. All right. So do you fold up the tent? Do you roll everything around you? Do you become a prepper and just say, you know what? I'm going to lock myself in my guns and I've got my can of beans and I'm going to outlive the apocalypse for about six more weeks than anybody else. You know, they're all going to hell out there, but we're going to, we got it in here. Is that the response that a genuine believer should have toward the lostness of our world or, or, <laughs> <laughs> now that I've messed with the flat earthers and the preppers and the, <laughs> or 
should our response be to get our butt somewhere out there in the public and begin to actually ask the question? I saw a sign the other day. And I said, hey, look at that sign. It's up there in the middle of the city. And it says this, Jesus, heaven or hell. And it's positioned in East Nashville. And I think that's a beautiful sign. Let me put lights around that sign. Friend, uh, hey, um, I'm your buddy. I'm your black buddy. <laughs> I remember our KKK episode. Uh, one of your neighbors here giving gifts to the folks, letting people know about the love of Jesus Christ. Hey, man, just, just wondering. When you die, are you going to go to heaven or hell? It's a pretty important question. You got that situation worked out? And I've had some tremendous conversations with people. So what do we what do? we Do Do we fold up our tent and we say, you know what? Nobody around here wants this. Nobody around here following Jesus. Nobody seems to care about this. And so we're just going to fold up our tent. Or do we begin to ask the question? And I'm going to have to remind you that at some point, whether you do it in a gentle way or whether you do it in a more, uh, I should say, peculiar way, <laughs> more pointed way. <laughs> You're going to have to ask the question. You're going to have to have this word that 2024 um, believers who are alive in the Western context and mindset struggle with. And it's a word called confrontation. There's going to be a confrontation. I don't care how nice you think you are. If you're going to retreat from the mission, I'm going to call you a coward and hope that you get shot in the back. That's how cowards die. And obviously I'm not talking about physically shooting. because You would definitely get some strikes for this show. I'm just saying that's a cowardly response. Don't run away from the fight. Run into the fight. Run into confrontation. And look, if you're the nicest, most soft-spoken person that's out there, I'm not trying to tell you to, to be like me you be who you are but at some point you're going to have to confront someone's way of thinking the collision course of your life and what it is that you do and what it is that you strive for and what it is you talk about and what it is that you have around you and the place that you live and the things that you drive and the things that you buy and the things that you do is going to be a confrontation to the world around you and if you say something in which you should say something about what it is that they can have as a result of joy that's going to be confrontational and so I'm thus assuming that the true believer and the true follower of Jesus Christ is one in whom they recognize that there is something better that they have to offer to the world than what the world has to offer to them. I get so confused sometimes when I see so many believers who are just hanging out on the sidelines. and I'm wondering, what are you hanging out for? It's almost like you're waiting for a better offer. You're waiting for something better to come along so you can say, oh, yeah, well, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to spend my life and passion and energy for. I'm just I'm just kind of floating out here and just I'm just going to go to a church and just we enjoy the music and I'm just going to go and uh, hey, wait, and then go do whatever I want to do. What the heck is that? Devote your life to a passion. Live for a purpose. Do what God has called you to do. And it's not hard to figure out what that is. What is hard is the thing that's in your brain telling you, I can't do that because uh, in this country, they don't want to follow Jesus. I mean, in this part of town, they don't like Jesus. Oh, I, I mean, they're going to be mad at me. They're going to look at me. Oh, I might lose my job. Oh, they might they might do something to me. I might get blacklisted. I mean, what, what, what are we doing? Here's Daily Bread going all around the world. They're asking the same question. I mean, this is not, this is not like a magic formula or anything. Daily Bread is not... Uh, the Billy Graham crusade. But it seems that every place that they've gone, and I was I there with them. I don't, I don't, I wasn't there with them. But it seems like every place that they've gone, they found at least one person that they can talk to about Jesus who's joyfully accepting and joyfully advancing the kingdom of God. Oh, well, what about you? You remember the old song, Babby Mason? Each one, reach one. What about you? And in Israel, Messianic Jews and Palestinians, in spite of cultural expectations of Jesus as just a good man, are bold even in the face of persecution to declare him as the resurrection and the life. Jesus announced he was the resurrection, and almost 2,000 years later, all around the world, we see his life flow through those who trust in him. But for this message to unlock real life for each of us, 
we must respond with faith to the same question Jesus asked Martha. On this Easter Sunday, do you believe this? All right, that's the question. Folks, get your tambourines ready, because that was a great devotion today. And uh, there'll be others like it, because it's Easter week. Resurrection Sunday is on the way. Get your tambourines ready. All right, Kimberly, good morning. I want to direct that to you because every <laughs> show so faithfully, I noticed that you were watching there. And uh, yes, I don't say good morning to you enough, but thank you so much for your watchership. And uh, man, good devotion today. I'm going to be more like it. You guys know I'm not. <laughs> oh, hey, hey. Yeah, Big Head said, uh, this is kind of a way of life around here. It is a way of life, isn't it? All right. Well, we got two for Tuesday. All right. We're doing good on time. Uh, so let's get some Erskine music here. And uh, in just a few moments, we'll come back after this song. It is, after all, a music show. Uh, Grace made the first move. It's a song that I'll be singing this week. Don't worry. Together Church in Springfield, Illinois. I'm coming for you. I'm going to be singing this song when I come. I'm a self-made man With my well-laid plans And I was taught to do it on my own But I've tried and failed And I've been derailed From dust you picked me up And now I know
All right, folks, that was Grace Made, the first move, biblically and theologically sound. Read Ephesians chapter 2, and you'll recognize that we were dead in our sins and our trespasses. We didn't make the first move because we were dead and couldn't make the first move. It was God who made the first move, and so we responded to him. Hey, we're going to get into Calvinism today. I've not talked about Calvinism a lot on this show because I don't have to. It's so referentially true as you read your Bible that I don't need to spend a lot of time talking about Calvinism. But today I'm going to uh, get some sound from uh, John MacArthur. But before we do that, let's hear Lee Strobel talk to us about an event that occurred that kind of had a time release capsule. And so I got sound effects now. And you say, what does dolphins have to do with our show today? Absolutely nothing. All right. So uh, here is a couple of my boys that just want to give a quick shout out. They want to give a quick shout out. I, got, I love these guys, man. Hey, what's going on, y'all? It's your man, Rob J. What's up, y'all? Ryan Christian. Hey, man, we represent Bridge Church in Omaha, Nebraska. And you are watching the Erskine Music Show. Yeah, yeah. Let's go. We need to do a couple things. Like and subscribe. Say it with me. Like, like and subscribe. Let's, let's go. go. Let's get it. <laughs> All right, this is one of our two stories for today, and uh, let's get this thing on here again, uh, again. We got a story, Lee Strobel, and let me let me give a shout out to this. This is um, Cliff Buell, looks like, and he has a lot of incredible shorts that he does of just getting Christians to think about this. And so we'll watch this through all the way one time. Then the second time we go through it, I'm going to be stopping it. So let's just watch it one time all the way through. Listen to what's being said here. It sounds like it's raining outside. That's good. I just washed my car yesterday. Of course. Uh, Nashville, I'm going to have to alert you guys whenever I wash my car. Because more times than not, I'm not superstitious. I'm just saying, more times than not, it's a good predictor of weather patterns. Or it could just be the weather patterns. You need to watch this. I'm a new Christian. I'm still editor at a newspaper in Chicago. And I felt the Holy Spirit in a very specific way nudging me to go into the business office of the newspaper and invite my atheist friend to come to Easter services at our church. So I went up to him. I said, how are you doing? He said, I'm doing great. I said, you know, Easter's coming up. It's a struggle. You know, I'm an atheist. I don't observe Easter. Easter's when we remember the resurrection of Jesus. He said, well, he wasn't resurrected. I said, well, actually, there's good evidence he was. He looked at me and said, I don't want to go to your stupid church. I went out and I thought, what was that all about? Why did I feel so specifically compelled to go and invite him to Easter services, talk about the resurrection, I shared the gospel with him, and he just shut me down. And I'm telling you, this bothered me for years because to this day he's an atheist four years later by then i'm a pastor and a guy came up to me at church one day and he said can i shake your hand and thank you for the spiritual influence you've had on my life he said one day not long before easter i was in the business office of the newspaper i was on my hands and knees working on the tile on the floor behind a big desk and you walked in i didn't even think you knew i was there start talking to this guy about god and you start talking about the evidence for the resurrection and you start inviting him to church and this guy was shutting you down i'm on my hands and knees listening to all this stuff and my heart's beating fast and i'm thinking i need god as soon as you left i called my wife i said we're going to church this easter she said what i said yeah he said we came to your church at easter i came to faith my wife came to faith and our teenage son came to faith and I Subscriber follow. All right. Check that out. Uh, let me get some of this stuff over here. We got a little lag. We got a little delay. And then obviously on rainy days, we know streamy fasty. So let's get back to this. You watched it through the first time. And the first time I listened to it, I'm hearing... And I'm reminded of this because I've got, I don't know how many of these books that you have, the case for Christ, the case for faith, the case for Christmas, the case for the resurrection. There's like five or six Lee Strobel books, and they all kind of do the same thing. If you guys don't know who Lee Strobel is, he's still alive. He's still with us. <laughs> I met Lee Strobel about four or five years ago at the National Religious Broadcasters, and uh, a great man took the time, came over, said hello. Didn't know who I was, but we ended up chatting for a few moments. Uh, but if you don't know who he is, he was a journalist. He was one of the top journalists, I, I believe, the Chicago Tribune. And his sort of bent is to go and to investigate things to their nth degree. And so a lot of a lot of news outlets have kind of picked up this mentality. They'll have somebody that goes and does an expose and are they dumping trash in this particular area? And here's what they're really doing with taxpayer dollars. And here's what the classrooms are really like. And who made these decisions that led to these kind of things? And what are we doing with it? So there's a lot of this kind of expose kind of things that's going on there. And so Lee Strobel 
he's kind of bent journalistically trained to be able to do that kind of has a mindset to do that and so his assignment was based on his curiosity based on things that he had heard okay i'm going to go investigate jesus i'm going to investigate the claims of the resurrection i'm going to investigate uh, the claims of who jesus said he was corroborating evidence that comes in and i'm going to to present a case in his mind he was thinking a case against the resurrection of Jesus, a case against the historicity of Jesus, a case against the verification of miracles and, and various other things that we find in the biblical material. And what he began to find out is the deeper and deeper that he got into the research, the more and more the evidence and the pieces of evidence began to mount up to the point where his wall, the Holy Spirit brought the wall down in his own life to be able to say, this is not just stories that are made up. This is not just fanciful. This is not just somebody's uh, figment of imagination. But these stories have a high degree of credibility. And so in going back and reading the biblical accounts from the mindset that this is highly credible evidence, then what is Jesus saying about himself? And that's how the Lord ended up bringing him to faith in Christ. And so if you can kind of couch that in the context of what it is that you're hearing here, here's Lee Strobel, who now is going back into the office and he's got this newfound faith. He's got this newfound recognition of who Jesus is. And everything is beginning to change in his life, even to the point here, the conversations that he's having with his coworkers. Why would he? And this is a question that I would ask you today. Why would you, if you have the truth, not share that with the people that are around you? That would be one of the most awful things that I think that a person could do. Uh, I'm not going to rebuke you or anything for that, but you certainly would you you would and you should rebuke me if i say hey um i've been um working on the cure for cancer and this is tested out 100 percent of the time that this cures every form of cancer that's out there but i'm not going to share it with you i'm just going to keep it to myself because i might it might you know kind of mess with your mojo or maybe you have another treatment plan or maybe you want to do something like that and so I'm not going to bother you with this cure for cancer. I'm just going to keep it to myself. I'm just going to talk to myself and I'm going to talk with my other friends who already have the cure for cancer and we're not going to share it with you. You would excoriate me and you should. You would say all sorts of evil things about how wicked and how deplorable I would be to withhold that. So imagine now Lee Strobel is going into the place of work and he is sharing the faith with the people who are around him. And what happens? It's, uh, you know, <laughs> it's facing the Giants. Once we find Christ, everything gets better. We win the state championship. We kick the field goal. We go the whole distance on the football field, right? Everything gets better. No, it got much worse in certain situations. And here's this guy that he's inviting to church on Easter, Christmas and Easter only. The CEOs will be out in full force this, this week. But he's inviting him to come to church because he wants people to hear about who Jesus is, the claims, the resurrection. He can verify all this from his research and just mounds and mounds of research and evidence. And the Bible's right there. And he believes the Holy Spirit is going to take that and become effective in people's lives. And he goes to his co-worker and his co-worker says, Man, I don't want that junk. Get that coin out of my face. What a, it was what he essentially said. It was in a very Nacho Libre style that he did that in. But get that Jesus out of my face. I want... I don't want to have to hear about Jesus. I don't believe. Look, you keep your Jesus to yourself. I don't want the resurrection. I don't want any of that stuff. I don't believe. I'm not going to believe. You can just take that. Eat your sandwich. Don't mess with me for the rest of my life. I'm good. I am G-O-O-O-O-O-O-O-D. Good. And so Lee struggles. He's downcast. But what's going on in the background? There's a co-worker who's he's changing out something and he's on his hands and knees and he's down there and he's hearing this conversation he's hearing this conversation of this guy that's being invited and the holy spirit begins working in his life the holy spirit begins captivating him and he begins to tremble there's adjustments that should be made in my life and so he takes his wife and they go to church and takes his children and they go to church at least his son i don't know how many children he had but at least it takes his son his teenage son I have a special heart for his teenage son comes to faith in Jesus Christ and so now this family has come to faith and it's somebody that Lee wasn't even talking to and so listen to this again in light of what's 
being said here and listen to this in the light of you thinking about in your own life those in whom look you got to have the conversation out loud for anybody to hear it somebody might reject it but somebody might be listening who's ready to receive it at that moment listen to what's being said for more christians you need to watch this a new christian i was still editor at a newspaper in chicago and i felt the holy spirit in a very specific way nudging me to go into the business office of the newspaper and invite my atheist friend to come to easter services at our church so i went up to him i said how are you doing so i'm doing great i said you know easter's coming up it's a struggle you know i'm an atheist i don't observe easter easter's when we remember the resurrection of jesus that well, he wasn't resurrected that's actually there's good evidence he was he looked at me and said i don't want to go to your stupid church i went out and i thought what was that all about why did i feel so specifically compelled to go and invite him to easter services talk about the resurrection i shared the gospel with him and he just shut me down and i'm telling you this bothered me for years because two this day, he's an atheist. Three years later, by then I'm a pastor, and a guy came up to me at church one day, and he said, can I shake your hand and thank you for the spiritual influence you've had on my life? He said, one day, not long before Easter, I was in the business office of the newspaper. I was on my hands and knees, working on the tile on the floor behind a big desk, and you walked in. I didn't even think you knew I was there. He started talking to this guy about God, and he started talking about the evidence for the resurrection, and you started inviting him to church, and this guy was shutting you down. I'm on my hands and knees, listening to all this stuff, and my heart's beating fast, and I'm thinking, I need God. As soon as you left, I called my wife. I said, we're going to church this Easter. She said, what? I said, yeah. He said, we came to your church at Easter. I came to faith. My wife came to faith. And our teenage son came to faith. And I just want to thank you. Subscriber, follow. All right. So before we get up out of that thing, really quickly here, it doesn't take a whole lot of qualifications. <laughs> it doesn't take a seminary degree. You don't have to be a journalist in the Chicago Tribune. All those things are nice. But here's my question to you today. Are you at least ready to give somebody something? Give them something today from the Bible, hopefully from the Bible. <laughs> I don't know where else you'd be getting it from, but uh, there are corroborating sources outside of the Bible that do verify that what the biblical claims are historically uh, happen in reference to the life of Jesus. Are you ready to give somebody something today? If they were to come up to you and say, hey, I just want to talk to you about the historical claims of Jesus, the fact that he was a man who lived in history here, AD 4 to about AD 32, somewhere around in that area. Uh, in uh, Palestine, he walked around, he did miracles that were verified by the disciples. Many people began to follow him at a particular time. The religious leaders of his time recognized that he was going to be a problem. And so there was a plot, there was conspiracy, there was a crucifixion that took place. They put him in a tomb. That tomb, after three days, was empty and they didn't find his body. And so some people believe that his body was stolen um, but that doesn't make any sense because the, the tomb was being guarded and they had every incentive because the religious leaders knew that jesus was claiming to be the messiah they had every every incentive to just produce the body not only could they not produce the body but <laughs> i was listening to nick Friedrich the other day and they were saying that uh you have uh over 40 people for over 40 years who are holding a secret that they know is false if the resurrection is not true somebody in that group would have said hey guys you know for fear of our lives maybe we need to just go ahead and tell the truth and <laughs> it has been called the watergate argument for the resurrection of jesus you know you can't have you know 12 guys who can hold a secret like that for more than three weeks you see how watergate ended up so if this massive secret this massive conspiracy was taking place among the disciples and they're you know, talking to themselves and saying, okay, you got, you know, he wasn't really resurrected. You know, the tomb wasn't really empty. Um, but we're going to propagate that, that untruth, um, especially in the face of the Roman government, who has every incentive to squash that out. And the religious leaders of the day who were vehemently against the claims of Jesus, the king of the kings, king of the Jews, um, we're just going to propagate that. Which is, by the way, I'm just going to really quickly stop at this point and just say so anyway i'm giving evidence for the resurrection of jesus you don't need a seminary degree to do that you just have to read your bible read your bible you talk to people about what you're reading but let me just go ahead and say this when when i heard a flat earther try to use this same logic to prove flat earth theory i about fell out of my seat because it's the same argument in reverse they said well we have all the major world religions we have islam buddhism uh Judaism, Christianity, they all got together and they conspired and they said, you know what, we're going to tell people that the earth is flat. And so not only is it a religious conspiracy, but it's a scientific conspiracy, the working in conjunction with the government and all of them agreed and none of them is breaking rank. And so the flat earthers all, well, I shouldn't say they all believe this, but many of them believe that this massive conspiracy is being held by those who vehemently are diametrically opposed to one another. 
and I won't go into the crusades or any of the things like this, but groups that have avowedly fought one another to the death have all conspired to say, well, we can't disagree on, or we can't agree on other things, but we, we can agree on is that we must tell people that the earth is round because after all, we know it's flat, but if we tell people the earth is round, it'll help us be more in unity. I don't know why people would use that logic, but the logic is sound logic. Like why would people who know that there's a lie maintain that lie generation after generation after generation after generation? And so Lee Strobel is there and the guy thinks that he's there for him. The guy's convicted because he's given him something to think about. And he's thinking about this. And he's like, man, I, I, I need to do something different than what it is that I'm doing. And I'm wondering today if there's somebody who's watching this show or somebody who's out there today who's recognizing uh, I need to do something different. I've heard something. I've seen something. Well, come see a man. His name is Jesus. And I don't know what the dolphins have to do with any of that, but they're here. All right, let's get out of that. Let's get out of that. We got to get to Calvinism today. Calvinists, Calvinists calling all my Calvinist friends. Calvinists, are you guys out there? Arminians? I, look, I don't know anybody who calls himself an Arminian. I just know people who are Calvinists, and I know people who say that I'm not Calvinist. Um, you know, there are some Mullinists that are out there, um, but we're not going to deal with them today. The Lord will deal with them. <laughs> but let's get to our second top story for today. This is Calvinism, and we're going to get a little John MacArthur up in this bad boy today. You say to yourself, that's not John MacArthur. You tricked me. It's a bait and switch. It's a Todd Friel that's going to be giving us the explanation here of John MacArthur. It's gonna, this is the clip, he's going to just let it play. But I wanted to at least show Todd Friel because, you know, maybe I'm too hard on a brother sometimes. Todd, if you're out there and you want to come on the Erskine Music Show, I'll be really nice to you. If you, come, if you come on my show, I'll be nice to you. <laughs> That's your condition for coming on the show. I'll be nice to you if you come on my show or if you invite me on your show and uh, we can chop it up a little bit. But, uh, you know, I don't agree with everybody about everything sometimes i don't agree very much with a certain person about certain things but you know every once in a while todd Friel and i we, we land on the same page he's a good calvinist he's a good reformed brother and so let's hear i wanted you guys to see todd Friel so that i can point people to wretched radio if you like this kind of teaching then you can find on wretched radio uh, more information and more sources that are like this and so i wanted to at least be kind in that regard and say, if this is your thing, then let it be your thing. So I'm kind of in and out from time to time uh, on Wretched Radio, John MacArthur. You know, I don't think that sometimes a reform group does a great job of sort of being self-critical. And I feel like maybe I feel like <laughs> sometimes the reform circles that are out there do a fantastic job of being critical and finding the speck in other people's eyes. But sometimes not in their own eyes. But anyway, all that to simply say, I think John MacArthur here gives a brilliant answer and a brilliant response to this age old question of predestination, free will, election, and all of these different things. I've never really thought about it from this perspective because I don't spend a lot of time thinking about it because I know it's so re referentially biblically true that I don't spend a lot of time talking about or thinking about Calvinism. I don't spend a lot of time thinking about Calvinism because I just read my Bible and I see it on every page of scripture. I don't spend a lot of time talking about Calvinism because I don't have to. All I have to do is just preach the Bible and people, people, <laughs> the elect will come. Uh, so anyway, here's John MacArthur and he's talking about um, Calvinism and this is an incredible response. I, I really love this. We'll, we'll stop along the way. But uh, check out what MacArthur says. Dr. John MacArthur is setting forth. Uh, let me do it this way. Okay, I'm going I'm to give you a little test. Okay. Um, 
Do you believe that God is sovereign in salvation? Of course, we went through that today. Do you believe God chooses who will be saved? Of course. Do you believe the Father draws? Yes. Do you believe that the, the Son keeps? Yes. Do you believe the Son okay. raises? Yeah. It's all okay. sovereign. It's all predestined. Okay. It's all established. Okay. Absolutely okay. right. Okay. This is what the Bible says. Uh, do you? Okay. Now, let me. <laughs> John MacArthur was machine gunning through that because I turned it up to 1.25 speed. But you do believe that God is sovereign, right? Huh? Dolphins? The dolphins believe. <laughs> the dolphins even believe. Even the rocks will cry out. <laughs> But the dolphins believe in the sovereignty of God. If you're a person who has this massive flaw in your theology and you don't believe in the sovereignty of God because in some way, shape, form, or fashion, you have elevated human free will to the place where God really would like to be able to do something in a person's life. But, I mean, God's got to wait until that person, that person decides what God can do. Or God really would like to do something about that group or that tribe or the gospel going to that place. But... I mean, he's just going to have to wait his turn or God is just going to have to figure out how to work around the other plan that man has put in place. That is bad theology. That is <laughs> abhorrently bad theology. And if you're out there and you believe that human free will trumps God or stops God or limits God or causes God to have to rethink, uh, reimagine replan, reinvent what it was that he had originally wanted to do, then you are not reading the Bible. You are not recognizing the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. And so when you begin understanding that God is the creator and God is the sustainer and God is the one who's unfolding the plan of redemption progressively in the Old Testament so that we see and we're pointed to Christ and that Christ is the fulfillment of the, the command of God, the law of God, it it's almost like a stepladder that trains us, teaches us, brings us to Christ. And we see Christ in the fullness of who he is and his plan and scope of redemption. If you think any of that happened just because God was trying to figure out a way to get things done and that was the best possible plan that he could come up with based on what people were going to do free will wise, he knew what they're going to If you're doing all those different gymnastics, that's unnecessary. I just want to say, I'm not going to make fun of you because why would I, why would I do that? It's the doctrine of grace. I would be making fun of myself if I was making fun of you, friend. If your theology is weak in the area of free will and predestination, I'm not going to make fun of you at all because I used to think that way. I used to be such a, because I'm a prideful person, I was staunchly, no, it has to be free will. It has to be my own initiative. It has to be what I want it to be when I want it to be. And the condition and the basis by which God had to choose me, there had to be something intrinsic within me. I used to think that way. And so I'm never going to make fun of you guys. So you got a you got a home on this show if you are not reformed, because I was not reformed at one point in life and thought it was all dependent upon me. John MacArthur is going to ask some very important questions to help us get our theology a little bit better. And if we have our theology a little bit better, more biblical, uh, he's going to begin unpacking this mystery. And look, I'll be honest with you today. The dolphins nor myself are going to solve this for all time for all people. Maybe that was a little overspeak, but not much. Um, but he is going to give us a broad way of thinking about this, or at least maybe a broad way of categorizing this that is a little bit broader than just, is it this or is it that? Let's expand the conversation a little bit today. Expand our minds a little bit today uh, in reference to the question of predestination, election, free will, Calvinism, etc. So he's talking fast because I sped it up. So you better think fast believe that um, whosoever will may come. Yes. That's what the Bible says. Um, do you believe that God finds no pleasure in the death and judgment of the wicked? Yes. Uh, do you believe that uh, Jesus wept because sinners wouldn't repent? Of course. Uh, do you, are you willing to call all sinners to repent? And do you believe they're responsible if they don't come? Yes. Mm -hmm. well, how, how, how do you harmonize that? I don't know. I don't know how to harmonize that. Well, you're, expect, you're asking too much of me. I'm not God. You want my life? Good answer. <laughs> And that's, I think that's a, that's a wise man. That's a wise man standing on the shoulders of giants to say, like John Calvin would say in his commentary of Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to God. Uh, I'm not going to be answering all of these questions on behalf of God because he's presented me with several different options and opportunities as it relates to the doctrine of election, as it relates to the doctrine of predestination. And I was watching some R.C. Sproul the other day, in fact, yesterday, as I was prepping for this, and uh, he was talking about, 
the late great R.C. Sproul, he was talking about how the doctrine of predestination, there are people who reject the doctrine of predestination because they don't understand what the doctrine of predestination is, but they reject the doctrine of predestination based on the name predestination and what that may possibly convey. And he's like, that doesn't make any sense because the word is actually found in the Bible. So what are we rejecting? If you read the Bible in context, in those passages, then you get an understanding of what predestination is. But beyond that, you can't reject the doctrine of predestination. So he begins this by saying, like, check, like predestination, boom, election, boom. God's going to say, boom, boom, so God's sovereign, boom. But on the other side of that, on the other side of that, listen to what it is that he's saying. Um, Whosoever will, uh, will come. Yes. Um, God weeps. God is willing that none should perish. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, well, on the other side of that, yes. We don't know who that's going to be. We know that there's got to be some response to God. We want to offer that response to everybody, but not everybody will come. And so John MacArthur's done a fantastic job here of kind of laying out the parallels on both sides of the question about Calvinism, predestination, free will, all those different things. He's laid out human autonomy, human response, the um, ubiquitous presentation of the gospel to all people. And he's saying, I'm not going to answer that question because we can't answer that question. Listen to what he says about himself. This is John MacArthur. He is a smart dude. But I think the best that we ever get is to answer this question about Calvinism like this. A little peanut pea pusillanimous brain to grasp that? Give me a break. It's not my problem. Good answer. But... But the one thing I can't do is, is deny what Scripture says. Uh, this will comfort you. Who wrote Romans? This is basic. Christianity 101 here. Mm, he about to get you. He about to get Who you. Who wrote Romans? Can't answer the question, can you? Why? All of Paul? All his vocabulary? All his heart? All his thoughts? All his words? All of God? And yet not mechanical? That's a good example. That is a really good example. And we think about that in, in terms, and he's going he's gonna to hit us with another haymaker here in just a second. If you hadn't stumbled and fallen and been knocked out by the first one, he'll get you on the second one. I guarantee it. Who wrote the book of Romans? I just got finished reading Hebrews. So we might still kind of debate and answer the question, who wrote Hebrews? I think it was Apollos. But nonetheless... Who wrote the book of Romans? We've got verifiable evidence there. We can look at grammar. We can look at syntax. We can look at the biblical case related to harmony of the letters of Paul, the travels of Paul, uh, the earmarks of Pauline theology, grammar, syntax, all those different things. Paul, the person, Paul wrote the book of Romans, but it wasn't just Paul because all scriptures God breathed. So God wrote Romans through Paul, and it's not mechanical like he was talking about. It's not a, a complete dictation. Paul, you will write this word, and then you will write this word, and then you will put a period here, and then you will use vowel pointing, and then no, it's 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 flowing, it's it's expressive, it's contextual, it's grammatical, and yet it's all of God <laughs> who is revealing himself through this process. Ooh, that's good. Second haymaker's coming. I'll, I'll, since you did so well on that question, I'll ask you another one. Um, who lives your Christian life? God? So you want to hold him responsible for the condition of your Christian life? Who lives your Christian life? This is pretty, it's pretty basic, right? You're doing it right now, every day. Who's living your Christian life? You say, I am. Really? You say, mm. God is. I don't know whether you can convince everybody who knows you. Mm. Mm. You can't even answer that question. Listen to what Paul said. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet, not I. He mm. didn't know either. <laughs> he said, this is the divine mystery. It's all of me and all of him, and what's wrong is me and what's right is him. Mm. He said it well. It's all of me and it's all of him. And what's wrong is me and what's right is him. Mmm. Mmm. <laughs> Haymaker one. <laughs> Haymaker two. 
it's all of me. I mean, you do think you're living your life, right? I know there's this kind of disassociated thing that's going on here, but you do think that you're living your life right now. It's not somebody else. Nobody else is sitting in this chair right now. It is me. It's all of me. And yet, any inspiration that comes to my mind, any articulation that comes from my mouth is all of him. All the bad is me. All the good is him. How are we reconciling that? And what MacArthur is saying and what I'm saying and what you ought to be saying out there as you talk about Calvinism and all these different lofty but biblical things is to God be the glory. In every major doctrine of the Bible, in every major doctrine, you have an apparent paradox that you cannot resolve. Mm -hmm. I know that I'm kept eternally secured by God, but I also know I'm commanded to persevere in faith. Mm. Two sides of the same thing. Yes. I know I can't be saved unless I'm chosen and called, and I know I can't be saved unless I'm willing to repent and believe. Ooh, that's a good one. Come on. <laughs> Come on, my brother. Man, he's just throwing some haymakers in this thing. You will not. No one is a believer out there who wasn't called by God, chosen by God, elected, known before the foundation of the world. You were chosen by God. If you're truly a believer, you were chosen by God. But you had to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You had to repent of your sins. You could not have done that without God. And so what seems like a contradiction is in fact the culmination of what biblical truth unfolded looks like in our lives. We are not a contradiction. We are not a walking contradiction. We are the emphasis of the glory of God, how, how Paul in his letters, and I've just got finished reading the letters of Paul, how Paul in his letters talks about commending various believers for their faith because that brings him joy because ultimately he doubles back and he says that the joy that he has in the believers exercising their faith and their faith growing is commensurate with the plan of God and the mystery of God being revealed through the ages. And so it's both sides of that. And that's a tension that we need not let go of. That's a tension that we need not swing unhelpfully and unbiblically to one side to say, well, yes, it's only free will or it's only election. Well, how does that explain what it is that's going on in life in real time and space? We must have some response there because scripture gives us some response and some responsibilities in time and space. This is good. This is good. I don't have to harmonize it, but nor can I deny those things. Mm -hmm. And in the end, mark it, folks, in the end, God will get all the glory for every righteous thing that is done. Yes. Because it is all his work. Yes. So rather than answering the question by removing your confusion, I just spread your confusion over a wider area. <laughs> and you rest in the fact that you don't need to grasp the mysteries that are clear in the mind of eternal God. That's good. That good, that good, that good, that good. And that's Wretched Radio. That's Todd Friel. Like and subscribe to his channel if you'd like. All right. Let's get to this and any of your comments that you have here. I'm, I'm over time here, about three minutes. Plus three minutes. And so we'll very quickly get out of here. I'm ending with uh, your comments, but I'm also ending with um, we got a few spots left for the Create Writers Retreat. I'll play this, watch you guys' comments as they head toward the end of the show. What do you guys think about that expression of Calvinism, that expression of free will, that expression of humility, I think. At least that's where I want to come from, from this perspective. But I'm going to play this, and then we'll be out for today, coming back tomorrow. I'll probably be talking about Kanye tomorrow. i got a travel day. That, that's an easy story to talk about. It's an easy, hard story to talk about, but we'll also be talking about the resurrection. And then we'll be prepping up for our interview with Pastor Doug Morrow. I think he'll do an interview. At least we'll get some sound bites from him. I'll be doing, uh, for those of you who are in Springfield, Illinois, or in the surrounding area, I'll be there on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday evening, preaching a revival and also playing the best of Erskine music. And I got a couple of new songs I'm going to be playing. And so if you want to be the first to hear some of those new songs, Together Church on North Grand Street. Together Church on North Grand Street is where we will be this week. Headed out. Last show from the happy confines of Nashville, Tennessee. I will see you guys in Illinois. 
And then we'll be back for Resurrection Sunday. And uh, if you guys don't have a place to go, we're House Church Nashville here in Nashville. So anyway, uh, watch this and then we'll be out. Are you searching for guidance to navigate the next steps of your ministry of songwriting? Well, then look no further. We have a retreat for you. It is coming up. It's eighth annual Create Songwriters Retreat. It's hosted by myself, Erskine Anabatarte, and Lydia Walker Athey on May 3rd through the 5th at Peniel Ridge Retreat Center. It is just north of Nashville, Tennessee. Featuring keynote speaker this year, we got Gene Schmidt, who's coming in. He's a figure that is renowned in Christian songwriting, both international ministry and here in the States. He offers his invaluable insights into the networking opportunities and songwriting. Check this out. In addition to the guest speaker, which that's enough to justify the cost of this retreat, you will have the opportunity to capture your essence with David Delgado, who is doing headshots there, and, and record a demo of a song that you have written during the retreat with the Dove Award-winning producer, Stephen Lawicki. This retreat is a nurturing space for followers of Jesus who are passionate about songwriting. Don't miss this opportunity to be inspired, empowered in your creative journey. Sign up now.